Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so when charge transport data are a worm, um, I'm going to hopefully uh, clarify why I've chosen that title. Um, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about a, a specific example, a sort of local example about work we've been doing uh, in the area of um, data analysis, especially um, charge transport data. And um, while the example is quite different from what you've seen in Keith's talk, I think you'll see, uh, certainly I thought that, uh, you know, we, conceptually speaking, we're actually thinking about very similar uh, questions. Okay, um, I will also at the beginning tell you a little bit about the types of measurements we do, just to give you a sort of an appreciation of what kind of data we're actually looking at and what, what the challenges are. Okay, I am a, um, an electrochemist by training. Okay, and in my group in Birmingham, we basically work on a couple of different uh, projects. Uh, one is around single molecule biosensing using resistive pulse techniques. Uh, we also look at quantum tunneling in single molecule junctions, which is mainly what I'll talk about today. Um, we do some work on single molecule thermoelectrics, and we've also recently started to look at magnetic field effects in electrochemical processes. Now, while these look quite different on the surface, um, there are some sort of common aspects that, you know, are sort of unify all these or many of these uh, sort of areas and many of the experiments that we're doing. So, for example, you know, a lot of these experiments, and I hope you can see my pointer, but uh, a lot of the experiments um, are, uh, you know, readily automated. Okay, so we run many, many experiments in a, in a, in a sort of automated fashion. Um, uh, we obtain by our standards large data sets okay and what we often find is especially because we look at single molecule behavior we find large variance and rather complex behavior in some cases um, in these data sets okay but you actually have to combine all the all three to gain proper physical insight um, into the system you're studying okay and uh, as i said today i'll talk a, a little bit our, about our work uh, on uh, single molecule charge transport and um, if you're not familiar with the area, I'm just going to give you a sort of a flavor of what that um, implies. So this one here, this is 4,4 prime by pyridine. This is a, a very simple molecular wire, as we call it. Um, you see these sort of uh, the two nitrogen groups here, uh, and this you can actually use to connect this molecule to two electrodes, for example, if you wanted to study its charge transport properties. Um, and on the right here, you see the same uh, molecule just in a sort of um, that's more accurate representation where you see that these two rings here are sort of tw slightly twisted towards one another, but uh, and, and that also added the length here. So we're talking about objects that are about a nanometer in size, so actually quite, quite small. Now, um, how do you measure um, the conductance and electric properties of, a, of an individual molecule? Well, um, scanning tunneling microscopy is a very commonly used uh, tool. So what does that uh, entail? What does that look like? Well, it's basically a setup that consists of a conductive substrate, okay, where you put your sample, um, and a, um, a sharp needle, which is shown on top here. Um, and you basically bring these two electrodes close enough together that the electronic wave functions overlap. Okay? That means you've got electron exchange simply by uh, in, in, due to the quantum mechanical nature of electrons in these two conductors, you actually get electron exchange between these two electrodes, even though they're not in, in, in full contact. So typically we would talk about a small gap that's smaller than maybe two or three nanometers. Okay? Now, um, tunneling happens in both directions with equal probability, but if you apply a voltage, then you get an excess um, transfer from, let's say, one electrode to the other, in other words, you measure a current, okay? And it's this net current that we, we, we're using as sort of diagnostic tool. Um, it's a very generic or a very versatile method. It works in vacuum, in air, and even in, in solution environments. And uh, you can use it for imaging, of course, and just showing these two examples. Um, this here is a gold surface, gold 111 uh, in acetate buffer. You can clearly see here each individual blob uh, is essentially a gold atom and the scale here you know two, na two and a half nanometers across so you can use it for really high resolution images um, or here you've got a um, an example where we've got um, well a gold surface and a gold island okay and the difference here is about um, an atomic step height okay so it's a very distance dependent effect um, and in this case we have different types of molecules or uh, the same molecule but in different orientations on the surface 
and then you can start to study the structure of the absorbed molecule you know in other different conditions so really high resolution okay now how do you um, use that to measure the conductance of an individual molecule uh, well you use some form of spectroscopy okay so typically you would bring the molecule onto the substrate surface not just a single molecule but many molecules suitably spaced between one another so they don't interact um, then you would bring uh, the, the the stm tip the needle close to the surface and initially you might even bring those into full contact and that means that all the current passes directly from the uh, substrate onto the tip. And then what you do is you start pulling back that tip um, in a, in a, with a certain speed. Okay? And while this happens, uh, you might have a situation where this molecule here then binds to the, the tip. And then you've got current through the molecule um, as well as current through space. And then you kind of keep pulling that tip away until you perhaps reach this situation here. Okay, where you've got um, uh, essentially only through molecule current and the uh, junction is fully elongated. And then in the last step, the junction ruptures, okay, and then the current drops to normally effectively zero okay, because the gap is quite large. Um, and again, we can perform this measurement in an automated way uh, and you know, do 10,000s of repeats uh, overnight or, or over days. So this is the sort of uh, volume of data that we collect in this case. Now, what do the data look like? Well. Uh, typically we'd measure a current, okay, so over here as a function of distance, and initially uh, this was, well, the second scenario or the second uh, point where um, the tip and the substrate are in direct contact. Uh, this is this sort of uh, plateau here. Then you start pulling back, okay, you've got an exponential decay. Uh, at this point here, the molecule would, full, would be fully elongated, um, and then eventually it ruptures and it drops off, and then you can use the sort of plateau height that I've indicated here to extract what, how much current was actually flowing per, per molecule. Okay, now um, some of the key points around the uh, signal properties. Well, as I said before, the, uh, the, uh, the quantum mechanical tunneling effect is very distance dependent. So all this whole withdrawal process would be over after two or three nanometers. It's a very distance dependent effect. Uh, during this um, short distance the measured current would vary from let's say microamps to picoamps so we'd easily bridge sort of six orders of magnitude and we would often look at the current or equivalently its conductance on a log scale okay um, and while the noise in the system can have different origins it's typically of a similar magnitude to the uh, mean current okay so the noise the magnitude of the noise also changes significantly from very small distances to large distances. Now, you could also, of course, ask, well, why do you want to study this? Well, it's a very sensitive tool uh, and you can use molecules in various kinds of ways. At a high, at a high level, you might want to use, use them to protect surfaces. Okay? You can also use them to functionalize surfaces. If you think of a, of a sensor, for example, um, you can use molecules to make devices, not, not just single molecules, but in uh, thin films, for example. And you might want to study the molecules themselves. Okay, so you might be interested in the effect of a binding group here, as I said, the structure itself. Uh, and you might want to look at structure property relations, you know, what this sort of backbone here does to the electronic structure or the uh, electric um, conductance of the system. And if you look at that uh, sort of in a bit more detail, um, you'd have, let's say, one electrode here, the molecular bridge, and then the second electrode. And then uh, the current through this system is essentially given by this equation here, where this is just the diff difference in Fermi functions, essentially a representation of the applied voltage. And then you've got the transmission function here. And think of the transmission function literally as a you know, transmission spectrum. Uh, just now it's not for optical waves, but for, for electron waves. Okay, um, And that's what it looks like. Uh, you can see here, this is the um, logarithm of the transmission factor. Um, this is the energy relative to the Fermi energy of the electrodes, okay, and you know you can extract a whole, a whole loads of things from that. You can, well, first of all, show that for charge transport, the most relevant bit is around the Fermi energy, okay. Um, you can determine whether a material is a whole or an electron conductor, depending on whether the highest occupied molecular orbital or the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is closer to this, um, to the Fermi energy of the electrodes. Um, you can extract what the conductance would be based on, you know, the magnitude of T at the uh, Fermi energy, and you can even 
um, and I'm not going to talk about this in much detail here, um, determine what the, the thermal power, the, vo the Seebeck voltage of a molecular junction is. Um, and that's basically the, the voltage that you induce by applying a temperature gradient. And you may have heard uh, about thermoelectric energy converters, for example, which is the sort of same, same effect. Now, uh, it turns out, however, that the electronic structure and therefore the measured current can be very sensitive to sort of the local conditions, the binding geometry of the molecule, uh, the molecular conformation, surface roughness, but also dynamic effects such as atomic rearrangements. Okay, so while the data are inherently quite noisy, some of that noise in inverted commas um, could actually be physically meaningful. And uh, this is sort of an example of what those curves then really look like uh, experimentally. And that's just showing the sort of um, the uh, plateau region where the molecular uh, junction breaks off. You can uh, get this sort of wave-like behavior, you know, all sorts of different perhaps switching effects where it uh, uh, jumps back and forth between two different states. So what we find is that for while conventional expected plateaus uh, in this ideal scenario are present, there are also lots of unexpected shapes, fluctuations, telegraphic noise, switching, right? And some of these might just be artifacts um, in a sense that there may have been some environmental perturbation, someone slamming the door or something like that, okay? Which, which causes, of course, a, a certain response in the system, but is not in that sense physically meaningful. Now, what does that mean in terms of uh, analyzing data? Okay, um, as I said, by our standards, we get large data sets. Um, so typically we would have to record 10,000s, perhaps hundreds of thousands of traces to capture the full complexity of the uh, molecular behavior on the surface. Um, as I said, we have noisy data and there's inherent, even without that noise, there's significant inherent variance in the properties that we measure. Okay, and again, that has to do with molecular changes um, and, and so on. And especially for new systems, we don't make, want to make any assumptions about the expected behavior or the uh, sort of signal characteristics because amongst other things that could introduce user bias, okay? Um, and pre-2016, there were basically two strategies for data analysis. Uh, one was um, what I would call hand selection, okay? So people would have a certain expectation, would then go through these data sets, maybe not quite as large as they are nowadays, but they go through these data sets, search for events that are, you know, ali that align with some reasonable assumption, if you like, um, and you know that's actually quite using the, the brain as a neural net in that uh, case is actually quite good at finding similar events if you're an experienced user. Okay, but it's not, of course, not very suitable for large data sets. It's also vulnerable to user bias. Okay, and it's uh, you know expectation bias, and it's also difficult to reproduce. Um, then there was another school of thought um, who just took all data, right? Everything measured all the data, and then analyze the whole bunch um, at the same time, okay? That sort of requires that you get um, a sort of a success rate, a sort of an event rate of close to 100%. So that let's say the overall data set is dominated by certain molecular behavior, for example. People would then generate um, all data histograms, okay? 2D histograms, I'll show you an example in a, in a second. But of course, what that means is that it's very difficult to find and quantify subpopulations or even rare events in this sort of big uh, data set. Um, and there's, of course, risk of information loss. You might just miss the most important or most interesting bits just because you didn't expect them. Um, or, um, you know, and, and by and large, you'd, you'd say, well, maybe that's a, a rather blunt uh, tool to, to analyze these data again, because lots of information could be lost. And this is the sort of Typical um, result. Um, this is a 2D histogram of current versus distance data and a sort of heat map. Um, and you can kind of see here that, well, you well you can appreciate that there's probably quite different behavior here. So as we'll see, this is just an exponential decay. It gives you a linear a decay on a, on a log scale. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. Um, and uh, you know, there's based on this, there's very little you can do to, to tell those apart. Now, as I said, these were simulated data. And uh, what we have done here is uh, basically to produce, to, to, to simulate individual traces which, uh, which represent say typical experimental behavior. So for example, we'd have a, sim a simple plateau here. We have a plateau with telegraphic switching. We've got this sort of undulation here or simple exponential decay. 
And individually, there are several hundreds of traces for each. They would give us this sort of heat map um, for the individual classes. But if you, of course, if you mix them all up, this is what the uh, result looks like. This is what I showed you on the, on, the, on the previous slide. So this is clearly no good, okay? And from a, a data analysis problem, uh, point of view, you're basically looking at a classification problem where you don't want to make any prior assumptions um, about the data characteristics, but also about the number of classes or subpopulations in the data. And um, in this audience, I don't need to tell you that um, dimensionality reduction techniques can, of course, be helpful here. Um, and the typical sort of thinking would then be that you'd have measured data where you would have, let's say, 2,000 points per trace, um, let's say 100,000 traces. In some sense, these would be 2,000 dimensional data. Okay, then we apply uh, dimensionality reduction techniques, get a reduced representation, produce a scatter plot, and then use uh, you know clustering techniques, for example, to pull out different different subpopulations if there are any, and then proceed towards interpretation. Again, if you look at this at a, uh, at a more higher level, uh, you know, going from a data recording um, to dimensionality reduction and ultimately interpretation, um, the, the side effect, the nice feature of this is that the hypothesis um, for it, interpreting the data only enters at this final stage here after you've extracted um, original data traces and try to understand what was actually happening okay, in the, during the experiment. And an approach like that, uh, it, you know, would be less reliable on specific event shapes uh, in order to work. You don't have to make any a priori assumptions about the signal characteristics, therefore there's lower risk of uh, losing information. And now you can also uh, identify subpopulations, quantify them, and then interpret them separately. And we set off on this journey a few years ago uh, with this, this paper, uh, these two papers here, where we basically developed a dimensionality reduction technique um, apply to um, uh, charge transport data, uh, we call that MPVC, multiparametric vector classification. Um, and uh, since then, I've used this in a whole range of different uh, experimental scenarios to show that it works. Um, now, of course, um, you know, this is not the only one, and people have uh, used them since then um, used uh, techniques like PCA or even uh, neural networks. And I feel that uh, with this work that we started with MPVC, the field really had taken a new direction because before that, people really didn't use these sorts of techniques to analyze uh, the data set they obtained. Now, there's a lot to be said, of course, for things like PCA and MPVC. They're computationally quite cheap. Um, you do need to choose some sort of classifier or the number of uh, components or, or computed properties that you'd like to use for classification. Um, you might have questions about uh, data pre-processing here, normalization and so on. And there is of course also this um, a suspicion around variance-based methods. There might not be a deal for this particular problem at hand simply because we've got so much fluctuation um, and, and because of the noise characteristics in the data um, and the large changes in the observed uh, current values, for example. Uh, in the context of neural networks, you can also ask, well, if you do need to use class labels, for example, does that um, reintroduce user bias in some sense? Okay. Um, is there sufficient data to train the network? Um, there is one example where people have used um, DFT calculations, again, to inform that training. Um, but, you know, again, that introduces some sort of selection there. Um, and is the quality of the data good enough? Okay. And um, what I'm going to talk about now is essentially an idea that a uh, former co-worker of mine, Anton Vladika, uh, developed. Um, and it's uh, around uh, basically using image recognition, okay? Because normally we think of our data in a sort of sequential way, either current or conductance distance data, okay? But when we look at them, we actually look at images, okay? And um, what this um, basically shows here, this is a single example trace, and this would be on the logarithmic scale um, in the original data set. And then this is a distance scale, and this would be you know, what it was a single trace looks like if you repeat the measurements a um, uh, thousand times or 1,500 times, you plot them all on top of each other, you kind of see the sort of variance um, that I, I was referring to earlier that is inherent to this measurement. Um, and I should say that all the uh, analysis results that I'm going to show um, is published um, in this paper here, Machine Learning and Science and Technology, it just came out earlier this year. But the experimental data were measured when Anton was in Michel Kalam's group in Switzerland 
So we're not, we haven't really measured anything, but we looked in the data, at the data in a different uh, manner. Okay, so Anton's idea really was, uh, well, why not use already trained image recognition networks, such as AlexNet or ResNet or VGGNet, um, and look at our data, okay? And uh, many of you will know that these are uh, open access image recognition networks, already trained on millions of images and, and photos, initially hand-labeled, okay? So cats, dogs, ships, etc. Um, and once they're trained, they can identify objects in previously unseen images. Okay. Um, the training data are completely unrelated to the task at hand, but nevertheless, we want to use the ability of the image recognition network to recognize features in our classification task. And uh, in our case, well, um, we, as I said, we, we tried different image recognition networks. Um, AlexNet worked uh, best for us. Um, and uh, again, you may know that um, some AlexNet is uh, built uh, or made up of a feature extractor Okay, and a, a classifier, okay? And what you would do is you'd have an image as an input, um, so a certain format, for example, uh, you put that into the network and then you'd get a, a prediction from the network to say what's, uh, what's on the image. So in our case, uh, we've basically reformatted our data um, to, uh, in, into an image format, okay? And then what we've done is rather than using the classifier, We've actually bolted on a, a dimensionality reduction tool, such as an autoencoder, using the, the feature output um, from the feature extractor. And what we then get is some sort of dimensionality reduction, um, which we then plot in this way to look at, uh, at, at the cluster plot, basically. And I'm just going uh, to give you an example here with um, where we looked at uh, you know, Anton's previous data on uh, three different molecules. Okay, and this is a one for phenylene diisocyanide, one four because the isocyanide group is, is, is connected to this phenyl ring in opposite ends, okay? And then we've got um, um, a substituent here, which can have different um, chemical nature. It could either be just a hydrogen, then we call it BDNC. Um, it could be a, a methyl group, then it's MBDNC. And then we, or you could have a, a third butyl group, and then we call it TBUBDNC. Uh, and you don't need to remember the structure here, um, but um, just the um, just the, these acronyms um, uh, will be sufficient. Um, and if you look at the uh, sort of experimental data, for example, here for BDNC and MBDNC, you do see that there are you know differences in um, the current or conductance distance response of these two molecules. Okay, and what we're now trying to do is to use image recognition um, to differentiate. Okay, now. We started off with rather more conventional approaches, uh, PCA, MPVC, TSNE, and, and also another autoencoder um, applied directly to the raw data. Um, and what you can see here is, um, and again, I should say, because we measure them separately, we know exactly what we're putting in, okay? Um, blue is BDNC, orange is MBDNC, and TBU BDNC is green, okay? And, uh, you know, you can see here, well, the different results for PCA, MPVC, TSNE, and uh, the autoencoder. Um, and you can kind of see that the different molecules actually do feature in different areas of the plot, uh, even though separation isn't really the greatest. You can also then plot each individual cluster separately, okay? Um, and this is again, the same sort of color breakdown, the different molecules in color. Um, uh, as I said, overall, the separation isn't great. Um, but the molecules do feature in different parts. Um, what you also see is that, and ignore the black dots uh, for now, I will explain towards the end what these are. Um, within each molecule, um, there are no subgroups, okay? So all, you know, this is all quite sort of homogeneous, noisy, but homogeneous. And on this basis, we would say that, or expect that each group represents a single uh, ensemble, if you like, with, a, let's say, a given average and variance properties but overall just a single type of, type of event or type of behavior, okay? Um, and then we used um, a combination of AlexNet and an autoencoder um, to do the same thing. And what you see initially here is a very similar behavior, okay? So you do see that the different molecules feature in different areas of the cluster representation, okay? Um, but then there was something that really surprised us. When we looked at uh, MBDNC data, for example, all of a sudden we noticed there were actually two clusters, okay? And um, 
we thought, okay, what's going on? Uh, we separated out these two events and then look at the uh, 2D histogram data for each cluster. So this is now cluster zero and this is cluster one. Okay, and what you can see for cluster one is that there's actually, well, there's this plateau region here, uh, then a relatively, well, um, it's not a very steep decay here, um, a relatively shallow decay and lots of variance uh, uh, in this area as well. Um, and then you've got cluster one, which is this one here, uh, also a plateau feature, but a relatively um, steep drop off um, towards longer distances. Okay, and then you'd sort of do the normal sort of analysis we do. Um, we'd look at, let's say, conductance histograms, and we'd see that, for example, in cluster one, this sort of molecular peak, which corresponds to this plateau here, okay, is shifted slightly relative to cluster one, and you can maybe tempted to start to interpret uh, what we are seeing there. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, if there is a subgroup of traces with properties that are distinct um, from the rest of the group, well, maybe there is something else going on. Maybe there's a physically different behavior, okay? And um, if there are two uh, ensembles, well, where are they coming from, okay? Now, I should say that the physical interpretation is somewhat speculative uh, at this stage, and it's not a small task to actually find out exactly what's going on. Um, but you might, well, we find that the plateau height differs by approximately a factor of two or 0.3 logarithmic units. Um, and that tends to be the case if you have different numbers of molecules in the junction, one or two, um, for example. Yeah? This is the small effect on the log scale because uh, we want to be really careful. Um, the decay is steeper in one group, um, and that tends to be the case when the drop-off is uh, cleaner, right? So if there are no uh, atomic rearrangements in the, in the junction, for example, but just breakage, then we tend to get steeper drop, uh, and cleaner break-off distances. Um, and, uh, and that could be an indication for, uh, for what we're seeing. Well, we wanted to be careful though and just see what, um, how, how robust this finding actually is because again, the effects are relatively small. Um, so in this case, we then left the feature extractor untouched. This is still AlexNet, okay? But we changed, we increased uh, the training of the autoencoder. And uh, what I had shown you so far was all based on 300 epochs of training. But we look now at the evolution of the training, okay, going from 100 epochs to 300 and uh, 1,000. And for uh, the molecule B, D, and C, we actually don't see any further separation into clusters. So even if we, we increase training up to 10,000 epochs, there was no, no difference really. Um, the separation for M, B, D, and C uh, remains robust, okay? So this is after 100, that's not much uh, going on. After 300, this is what you had seen before. And after 1,000, uh, you know, this, this just becomes more clear, which is, which is good. There was not more going on, uh, again, after 10,000 epochs of training, um, which is sort of reassuring, okay? Um, now for T, B, B, D, and C, which is the, the, the clunky uh, side groups, what we see is actually that to our surprise, we also see a separation into two clusters, okay? Again, this is cluster zero and this is cluster one, okay? And again, this was not observed for, um, the, you know, in the original paper, for example, but also looking at more conventional data analysis tools. And if we look at the 2D histograms uh, for these two clusters, we again see broadly similar behavior, now a rather more slanted plateau, and there's something going on here at low, um, currents, okay, whereas in cluster one, there's a lot more variation here. Um, we see now that this molecular peak here appears at the same conductance, so that sort of ca cast doubt on our, you know, previous hypothesis that maybe in one case there might be a, a different number of molecules, or at least it doesn't support that for this particular molecule, okay. Um, and now basically we wanted to understand, well, what, what is actually more important and what's the most important effect for the differentiation into the two clusters in an effort to try to understand more where it's coming from, okay? Um, and returning to the case of the MBDNC system, um, we basically defined three region of, regions of interest, okay? We, had, we looked at the plateau height, we looked at the slope uh, in the decay region, and we looked at the presence of this high point density um, down here at very low um, currents. Well, we've got to be a bit careful though, I should say, because the experimental um, um, detection limit is about minus 0 0.5, 5.5. So it's, this is an, a region where we see, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
the limitations of the electronics, shall we just say. And what, then what we've done in this with the data is basically we've changed traces in cluster one mathematically so that they become more similar on average to those in cluster zero. Okay? And um, this is specifically what's happening in case A. We've basically just removed the low conductance region um, by moving all points below minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5 out of range. This looks like uh, this. Okay, So we move from here to here. Um, the second case, uh, case B, is where the slope of the tunneling decay um, is, is changed by stretching that particular decay region. So it on average matches the one in cluster zero. So that's the case here. You can see here the orange trace. Um, it's, got, uh, it's, it's, it's got a less deep decay here. And then we've got case C, um, where we change the height of the conductance plateau. Okay, and in this case, just by a log two, so 0.3 on a log scale. And this is a relatively small effect. Um, as you can go, uh, see here in the third diagram on the right. Um, and in the original paper, we've used the Fisher criterion to quantify cluster separation, but the effect is also visually clear, I think. So this is the original um, data um, that uh, we had seen. Okay, so these are the two clusters, cluster zero and cluster one. Um, in, um, I've actually mis mislabeled here, the, so this is case A now, where we changed the low conductance region. And what you see now is that of the, the traces that are originally in cluster one, they're now plotted in black and they actually move away from um, cluster zero. So even though we've made, at least um, at first glance, made them more similar in terms of the clustering result, it actually moves away from cluster zero. It's actually not getting more similar in that sense. Very different is the situation when we change the uh, tunneling decay. Okay, because now we actually see a very significant effect. In essentially, uh, well, all of the cluster one data plot move towards cluster uh, zero. So that seems to have a very strong effect. Um, and then if we double the conductance of the plateau, we also see a rather uh, notable change in the clustering result, again, towards cluster zero. And that tentatively led us to conclude that in terms of the, the importance of the different areas in the image, um, that it's most importantly the slope in the decay region that determines uh, where the, uh, the traces end up. Uh, secondly is the plateau height. Okay, and finally it's the presence of this high point density down, down here. So in a sense we've got this sort of order of, of priority if you like. Um, now I'm of course uh, having listened to Keith's talk, I'm also interested in trying this, uh, comparing this with um, some of the methods he mentioned. Um, and coming back to this uh, um, image that you've seen before, okay, the nature of those black dots, which I originally asked you to uh, ignore, uh, is now, of course, clear. It's uh, that second cluster that we identified using uh, Im the image recognition network-based approach. And you can see that all other dimensionality reduction techniques, PCA, TSNI, and, and so on, um, they all co-located these uh, traces in the same or similar region in the plot that they wouldn't produce a separate, um, um, a, a separate cluster, okay? So in some sense, you might say that the um, image recognition-based network is actually more sensitive to these sorts of differences. Um, so in conclusion, okay, uh, why the title? Well, uh, when charge transport data are worm, the reason is that uh, when you actually apply LXNet uh, with the normal classifier, you actually think that the input data indeed is some form of nematode. And you can't blame it because it actually does look like a wiggly worm a little bit, okay? Um, the network really has no domain specific knowledge and it doesn't even have to, okay? Um, it's only the feature extractor that was trained on unrelated data and feature extraction is still uh, successful, okay? Um, the trained feature extractor can then be used uh, with a small amount of unseen data. So there's no need for large amounts of data to, you know, of, of, of large amounts of application specific data for training a neural network, um, especially considering that, well, in this case, we used an autoencoder for dimensionality reduction of the feature extractor output, but actually you could use other methods um, to do that, um, such as PCA, for example. And we're currently working on um, applying this approach um, to other types of physical chemical data uh, with some very promising promising results. Okay, and, um, but I just noticed I didn't show that to you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the acknowledgements, um, I should especially thank Dr. Anton Vladika, who's now moved on to Finland, um, who's part of my group while this work was done and who's 
partly funded through the AI 3SD uh, network. Um, I should also thank collaborators, Eduardo Alonso, for example, at uh, City University of London and the computer science department there, and Katja Konisheva, who is a neuroscientist in at Bangor University, who actually set up uh, set us on the path um, uh, a few a few years ago. Um, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions.